Well, how's it going, YouTube? <laughs> Ah, uh, guys, I have been wanting to make you a video, and to be honest, I just struggle. I just struggle with content. I struggle with what I can share, what I feel comfortable sharing, um, what do I talk about? You know, I'm not really back into my kitchen yet full time. I'm still learning how to walk. I'm now learning to walk without a cane, and I had no idea <laughs> how hard it was to retrain your brain. So I'm learning to, um, right now, try not to walk with a limp and trust my leg and strengthen my muscles that have been cut into twice and muscles that have been atrophied and, um, and my posture and, um, it, it it takes a village. It takes a village. So I'm working really closely with my uh, physical therapists. I actually have four and uh, one is the main one and um, and he will just sit there and watch me walk and correct me and um, walk again and correct me and it is a process. So that's what I'm right now. That's where I am in my healing um, is just learning how to walk again. Uh, I I can walk, but I can't really carry anything. I'm not real stable. <laughs> I'm still walking around with a cane on nights that are really tough on me. I'm still using my walker. So, um, but I, I'm, I'm improving every day. I have a long list of workouts that I do. Strength training, I'm now lifting three pounds on that leg and four pounds on my good leg, which really isn't my good leg. It's actually the, the leg that I needed a knee replacement on before the accident. So, um, but I'm doing better. I'm doing better and I'm getting there. And my goal is to be walking unassisted, no more cane by the holidays. That's the goal that I've set myself for. So <laughs> that's what I'm working towards. So I struggle sometimes with like coming on here because, you know, I'm not canning, I'm not baking. I'm, you know, I just made my first pot of chili on Sunday. Um, so I, I'm just now getting back into my kitchen and, um, you know, I posted about my turkeys. So many of you love the turkeys. I love the turkeys. So I'm so glad that many of you love the turkeys. So I had thought, oh, maybe I should go out and like film some of my chickens and my turkeys, which I probably would have done today if it wasn't raining. So, so, but I knew I wanted to touch base with you guys. I miss you guys so much. And I, I, I knew I wanted to talk about something with you guys. And I was actually going to pop on here and talk about pantry building. Um, but I've been noticing that many of you um, have been asking me what happened to the man who hit us and, um, and killed Matt and critically injured me, severely injured both our children, and what all transpired, um, because I know I have not talked about that, and you guys, I don't talk a, a lot about the personal stuff anymore. For one, <laughs> the internet can be a really scary place, and um, I learned the hard way when I was in the hospital, and the sheriff's department arrived and had to move my rooms for safety, and I mean, it was, it was a big deal. And, um, so uh, I don't share a lot of the personal stuff anymore. I just don't feel comfortable. Second, it's really depressing. <laughs> so for my own mental health, um, I try not to focus on it. I try to focus on today and what I have to do today and healing every day and being in the word every day. Um, I do about four Bible studies a day. And so, um, like that's where I am just emotionally healing. But I know that, um, this is something I would want to know. And this is something that I want to share with you guys. Um, because I know so many of you prayed for us and, um, and this is kind of a big part of the story that I did not talk about and I did not feel comfortable talking about it when we were in that uh, courtroom phase uh, when we were awaiting sentencing um, he did plead his first off his name is Jared I'm not gonna release his last name uh, but I don't like to refer to him as that man or the guy or um, <laughs> 
for a little bit. I called him Matt's killer when I was going through my angry phase. Um, but he has a name and he has a family and his name is Jared. I believe Jared is 42. He's in his, he's either 40, 41, 42. Um, never been married, has no children. Um, so what he took from us, he will never really understand because he was never a husband. He was never a father. So um, that was difficult for me to realize, to come to terms with. Um, but thankfully, I have a really, really incredible uh, 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 grief therapist who's Christian based. And, um, and for the longest time, I, I met with her, you know, a couple times a week. Now, now I meet with her once a month just for maintenance. And, um, and she helped guide me through. She helped guide the children through and she was a pivotal part. So I would say if you are out there dealing with um, trauma, or a tragedy, um, grief, find yourself a really good grief uh, therapist um, because they are just, they're a game changer. So um, Jared pled guilty um, it had to go, you know, it's a whole process. It's a whole process. And the legal system in my eyes, so broken, it's so broken. It's not fair. Um, Jared was, uh, served one night in jail and then he was released on bail. And, um, I had to hear a lot of rumors of him still drinking driving. I don't know if those were true or not. Um, the prosecutor's office seemed aware of it. Um, they did give him a breathalyzer test um, after I asked for one daily. Um, but unfortunately, it was done at like 6 p.m. every day or 5 p.m., 4 p.m., something like that every day. And I heard that there were many ways around that, um, that he could go home and drink and breathe clean by the next day. So um, there was nothing random or anything like that. And I had to deal with a lot of anger because especially when I was in the hospital and because of COVID, I couldn't see my children and, um, and I couldn't hug anyone. And I was dealing with, um, I was dealing with these phantom pains where I was having this, um, these pains in my arms and in my body and they didn't know what it was until, um, my therapists, uh, said that it was, um, touch, uh, deprivation, touch deprivation. I had touch deprivation, you guys. I was so used to being touched by not only the kids, but by Matt, you know, uh, hugging me and touching me and being touched all the time. And I went from that to being completely isolated uh, for, what was it, a little, it was around two months, a little over two months, I think, between both hospitals. So, um, you know, the only visitors that I could have had to come to my window, but then because of being online and um, people calling the sheriff's department, they had to move my room to an inside courtroom, uh, court, uh, courtyard room. And um, then I couldn't get any visitors anymore. So I didn't see anyone. I didn't, my medical staff was amazing. The nurses, they would come in and hug me as part of my therapy, <laughs> but it was a lot. It was a lot. So, <laughs> Lord lift it, Lord lift it. Um, so, I had a lot of anger because I was grieving and I was grieving alone and my children were grieving and they didn't have me. And they were worried they had just lost their dad. They were worried about losing their mom. And, um, and here Jared was at home 
with his family and his friends. And from what I heard, you know, still drinking and, you know, um, so like his life hadn't ch changed and ours had. And so that took a lot of work, a lot of spiritual work, <laughs> a lot of spiritual work. Um, me and the Lord, we were in conference all day, every day, some days. <laughs> I was in constant prayer. Um, I actually wore a head covering for a while because I was in constant prayer. Um, and so anyway, took 10 months to uh, get to sentencing. And through that, every month um, when we were supposed to do a sentencing, like it was supposed to happen in, I think it was June or July, it kept getting pushed back, pushed back, pushed push back because he kept stalling. And then he wanted um, to recreate his own crime scene. And he wanted, uh, and of course, all this stuff fell through. Uh, it was just uh, 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 stalling tactics, which, you know, the lawyers were like, this is very common. We see this all the time. And I was like, but I don't. And so it's very hard. And so, um, uh, so through all of this, I was just working on myself and um, what I could control. And um, our sentencing was in early December. And um, I had no idea what to say. My lawyers, I had a team of lawyers, you guys. I have a team of, I have a team of everything. <laughs> I have a financial team. I have a team of lawyers. I have, I have it all. A team of therapists, a team of doctors, medical staff, surgeons. <laughs> um, and I, you know, my lawyer said, you know, write, you know, if you want to say a statement, write it out. And I just couldn't. Because what do you say? What do you say? And so by the time we got to sentencing, me and the Lord were besties. <laughs> And, um, and I went into that, uh, I was surrounded by, I was surrounded by the Lord's army. People close to me, Christians, that the Lord surrounded me with to go into that courtroom. And everybody wanted to know what I was going to say. And I, all I could say is, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And I prayed. I, I listened to gospel on the way there. And I prayed for the Holy Spirit to use me. So we were in that courtroom. And I asked if I could sit across from him instead of at the podium or in a chair. I, I could pick any place that I wanted. They let me pick any place I wanted. I didn't even have, I didn't have to be anywhere near him. But um, I wanted to sit across from him. I wanted to sit close. And uh, he had no problem with that. They had asked him, of course, and his legal team. And uh, his family was there. And um, they called me up. I was like one of the first, it was like the first thing. I got to talk the first thing. And so I sat across from him at, at, the, at the table, the defense table. And I took a breath and I reached over and I held his hand and I never lost eye contact and to be honest with you I talked to him for I think people said 15 minutes 20 minutes my pastor said I didn't blink once he said it was incredible he's like I don't know how you did it <laughs> um, I had I had my pastor was there um, a deacon from our church was there Mike um, a lady from uh, church who's on the board, her name's Ruth. She used to drive me to church when I couldn't drive. 
uh, they were all there for my church to support me. My dad was there and um, my best friend was there. I, I had, a, I had, like I said, I had, I had God's army with me there. And I leaned in and the Holy Spirit just spoke through me and gave him a message uh, that this was his chance to pivot. This was his chance to change his life. And he would never understand what he took when he killed Matt. Um, but God was giving him saving grace. And that we're all sinners, we're all broken. And that this was his chance to change his life and to make it so that my husband didn't die in vain and the kids didn't lose their father for no reason and how many lives he could help change or help save with his testimony, if he chooses it. That was pretty much it in a nutshell. Um, he wept, his eyes were bloodshot, shot. like I could barely see his pupils, they were so red and I, you know, you could smell the alcohol in his pores. And I continue to pray for him every day. My church continues to pray for him and his salvation. I can't control that. I can't control what Jared chooses to do from this point on. But I knew I had to let it go and I had to forgive him I grieve every day every day every day I think I will grieve every day for the rest of my life And I pray that he pivots. He was sentenced uh, five to 15 years. Um, had he not pled uh, guilty um, and there's charges. I, I honestly, you guys, I don't re I don't remember the official charges and all of that. Um, I do have two major traumatic brain injuries and I'm very thankful to be alive and, um, remember who I am, even though I know my personality and such has changed, um, a bit. Um, but, and I couldn't focus on all that. It was, it was too heavy, too heavy for me to carry. Uh, quite honestly, you know, I had to focus on my kids and that's, you know, and getting better for them so that I can take care of them. Um, but had he not, had he not um, pled, he was facing, I think it was 65 years in prison um, if it had gone to tri trial. I know the judge was very angry. Um, she wishes she could have sentenced him to all 65. Um, but she sentenced him to a minimum uh, for the state of Michigan. He has to serve the minimum. So the minimum he'll he'll serve is five years. The maximum he'll serve is 15. And that will all depend on 
if he chooses to rehabilitate himself. Um, there are classes that I, I've been told that like he, he will have to take. Um, he, you know, will face a parole board. Um, and depending on if he meets his requirements, uh, he'll be able to get out after five years. Um, and if he doesn't, you know, if he doesn't, uh, I know I've been told, uh, you know, accountability is big. He did not, uh, by the way, take any accountability. Uh, he was sorry for the accident. He was sorry that people got hurt. He was sorry that Matt died, um, but he got hurt too. And um, he just really saw it as an unfortunate accident. Uh, he felt victimized by his friends who allowed him to drive drunk. Um, it was very much, it was very much, you know, uh, blame everybody but yourself. Um, which I think really angered the judge. I let all that go though. I walked into that courtroom not, um, not focused on any of that. Um, I went into that courtroom focused on God and his mercy and his grace. And that he would use me in a way that would redeem this in some way. So that would be used in some way for his glory. And, and then I had to let it go because I can't control it. It is out of my hands. It's not my story. It's where Jared's story crossroad with mine and Matt's and Mina's and Mason's and Matt's kids. Kevin and Amelia and all of his friends and family that loved him. God is sovereign. The Lord is sovereign over all things and even if he Even if he didn't mean for things to happen, all things filter through his hands first. So I held on to that faith, blind faith. I still hang on to it. So that's what happened to the man who did this to us. He's now sitting in prison, um, I believe in uh, the southern west part of the state um, where he will be for the next, um, well, it's going on one year, so at least another four years um, until he's up for parole. And I'm praying that he gets the help that he needs and that um, he does the healing that he needs to do. Um, he has the same scar. He's got a scar on his forehead from hitting the windshield uh, that Mina has on her forehead. And uh, Nikki from a farmhouse full. <laughs> I'll put a, a link to her channel here. If you're not subscribed to her, you go over there. And uh, if you're a homeschooling mom, especially, um, um, she made Mina a doll um, that she could carry around with her 
that um, looks like her and has her scar. And um, it's a healing journey, you guys. We're still going through it. <laughs> but the Lord is a redeemer. And, um, and we're okay. We're good. We're good. We're healing. And um, I just do a lot of the healing in private, you know, because it's hard. Some days are tougher than others. <sighs> so, anyway, thanks for letting me share that. <laughs> 25 minutes, Heather. I really thought I was like, Lord, let me just not ramble on. But this was a, a deep topic. And I know it's one that many of you guys have been asking about, curious about. I would be curious about it. Um, one that I didn't feel comfortable talking about while we were in the, you know, in the, the, the swing of the legal aspect. Um, you know, my lawyers suggested that I not talk about it publicly. Uh, so I didn't, um, I didn't feel comfortable doing that anyway. And really I haven't, we're now, you know, we're heading towards, we're past the year and a half stage now. So we're heading towards the second year and a one year for him in prison. Um, he's in a level two facility. Um, I believe Michigan is a level uh, one, two, and then a four is the highest, the max. Um, I don't think there's a level three. Um, so he is a bit on the higher level side for security. Um, I know he's been moved once. Uh, so I do have somebody that keeps track of all that for me, so I don't have to do it. Um, I haven't decided yet if I'm going to, uh, write him or anything like that. I don't feel called to that right now. The Lord has not called me to do that. Um, but I was obedient to the Lord in that courtroom. And I do believe that the Lord used me. The Holy Spirit used me. The Holy Spirit talked through me because I can't really, I, I don't remember what I said. I just know what people told me. I said, um, the, I believe the courthouse said that I could get, um, transcripts from, um, from there. Uh, so I don't know, maybe one day I'll do that, but, um, so that's it anyway. Okay. I hope the next time I come back, <laughs> I'll be on a much brighter note. I really did want to make you guys like a turkey chicken update. Uh, I have a lot of new girls. I have some teenagers out there. I have 18 of them, dark chocolate egg layers. Uh, they're Moran's. I have um, some blue egg layers out there. I've got dark chocolate and blue because I, I do sell my eggs here and there um, uh, to people at church and and, and some uh, friends that live around here. Uh, I usually gift them out more than, than selling them though. Uh, but we were selling them for a little bit because I taught the kids in homeschool. It's one of our homeschool things how to be how to start a business, how to start a home-based business. And I did this when I was actually in on bed rest for my last surgery. And I was like, well, what am I going to do with my time? But I know what I'm going to do with my time. I'm going to teach my children how to run a, a home-based business. So we did. We worked together. We, um, we were like, well, what can we do? Well, we can sell chicken eggs. So we did. We ordered the cartons and stamps and uh, the kids collect the eggs. We wa They wash the eggs. We um, label the eggs. We get them in cartons. We label it all up. We take care of them. We bought a fridge just for the egg business. So um, it taught them a lot. It's teaching them a lot. Um, they work diligently. So really, <laughs> you know, the, the couple of bucks that we, that we earn, we usually take them out to ice cream for. Um, but, uh, it's, it's been a really good learning process for them. So, uh, so we've got some, um, we've got 18 new hens that we're introducing to the flock. And then I have a chicken that, uh, went broody 
a second year in a row. She went broody last year and she was unsuccessful. I let her do it naturally. And um, she lost two of the babies that she was sitting on. So this year when she went broody, uh, we helped her and um, brought her eggs in, put her in the incubator. We hatched them out, gave them back to her. She's now in her own little coop with them. Um, she, uh, I think three might be hers and then five are not. Five are, are eggs that she stole. <laughs> so, but I've got one rooster because he just found his voice. And when the big boys, I've got two bigger, older roosters, one and they crow this little guy he tries to crow and it's the most adorable thing I will maybe post it on my community tab and I'll also post it um over on Instagram and Facebook so you guys can hear it it's the most adorable thing you'll ever hear it's like it's so little it's so high and squeaky oh and I just love it and you know my chickens and my turkeys have been like a, a pivotal point of my of my uh therapy in in recovery and um because they bring me such joy and so I want to share more of them and I know many of you have never seen like heritage turkeys before and to know that so many of you thought that they were beautiful I was like oh you love the three stooges I I have four of them Frenchie is the girl but she thinks she's a chicken and she's in love with one of my roosters and so she really doesn't want anything to do with the boys but she's a turkey too <laughs> officially <laughs> so I've thought about going out there and just filming some of that I I really want to get those kinds of videos on TikTok cuz I could just make little videos and just share over there just just some chicken fun um but I haven't figured out how to how to film over on on TikTok yet I need someone to teach me so <laughs> So anyway, hoping that the next video I make will be a little lighter, a little more fun, bring you a little bit more joy than this one. Um, but I appreciate all of you who continue to pray for us and love and pour your love over us and who have been um, wanting to know what happened. That's what happened. And uh, there are no winners, no winners in any of this. Um, there's just heartache all the way around. Uh, I was able to meet with his family when we left the courtroom. Um, there are officers there that protect you from that if you do are not interested in that, but I was, my family was. Um, you know, my dad was able to meet his dad and um, and there was some real healing, I think, that happened uh, between our families. Um, but continue if you can pray for Jared, pray for his family, um, pray for healing for them. Um, because I can't imagine knowing that I took someone's daddy and husband, brother, friend, like I, I, I don't, you know, you know, even though in the moment he he too feels victimized. I, I pray that there's a moment that he, uh, a, a point in time that he realizes what he's done and is genuinely sorrowful and I pray for that. So it's all we can do. Lift it to the Lord. All right, guys, I love you. And, um, I'll see you again soon. Hopefully, right? A little happier of a video. All right. You guys take care. Bye.